Welcome back for shift number four. Um, I'm going to send a tweet about this really quick, and then we're going to jump in. While I'm tweeting, would everybody like to introduce yourselves as the uh, as the crawler for those who who may not uh, read scrolling text as well? Um, I certainly can at this point in my life or in my day, I guess. Um, whenever you're, you guys are all off, we're all off mute. So whenever you want to jump in. Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Garcia at Kenyon Driver on Twitter. You can talk about who you want to like, what, what you're doing here. You know how your day's been. Whatever you'd like. I got to. Oh sure, sure. Um, so today we're going to talk about Joel Ayayi. Um, if you missed me earlier, I did the Laker Film Room podcast. That should be a two part series, uh, specifically looking at players that the Lakers might be interested in uh, and who may line up with their team philosophy. And recently I started uh, LakersDraft.substack.com. I'm surprised by the amount of compliments and reception that it's had. So if you'd like to sign up for that, I'd, that'd be greatly appreciated. Uh, is everybody wearing headphones? I'm getting a little bit of a uh, echo. I am. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, who else do we have? Don't be shy. Hi, I'm Joseph Nation, uh, JNA1 on Twitter. Uh, I'm here to talk about the Sam Hauser today. I most of my draft content goes to the looneybin.com, uh, but most of my actual work at this point is doing analytics consulting. Uh, so yeah. Awesome. And I believe we have an international guest. Hey, Cedo, um, I'm Harlan. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm French actually, so I thought about it was a good idea to come and speak about a French player, but a French player that you all know because he's playing in the NCAA. We'll be talking about Yves Ponce. Uh, I'm working for a French website called Envergure, which means in French, wingspan. Um, we are specialized on the NBA draft. We cover FIBA, youth FIBA, uh, Adidas Next Generation, NCAA, high school, everything we can. And uh, English is not my fluent language, so I'm sorry for all of the horrible mistakes I'm going to do. but. It's a, it's a great uh, honor to be here. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, you speak English better than me, dog. <laughs> just uh, just like every French person I've ever met, they're like, yeah, my English is not good. I know how to use the Oxford comma. Um, I understand. <laughs> yeah. I understand how past participles work. Yeah. Um, it's just like I, I get it. The humbleness makes it worse because like I, I do not speak okay. good English. Um, you're going to do great. Um, Thank you very much. Give me one last moment. I have to remember how to spell Kai Jones. Um, I believe we have somebody talking about Kai Jones in here. Would you care to reveal yourself? Yep, that's me. I'm Ricky, here to talk about Kai Jones. I was on this stream previously to talk about Evan Mobley. Uh, so Kai Jones will be a fun one to dig into. I'm going to lay bare all of my Tyrus Thomas trauma on the stream. Man, I feel like a lot of flash plays for both guys. Tyrus, born a few years too early, man. Could have been good in this NBA, but uh, I'm at SB Nation doing a lot of draft work this week. So. Just had a just had a Sharif Cooper piece drop that I have bookmarked. I can't pretend that I've read it while I was on stream. I, I, I don't have those abilities, but I am very excited. And I've seen some snippets that are extremely encouraging. Um, and as a longtime reader, uh, we're, get, we're getting some some already great feedback on the on the Sharif piece in the chat um and yeah no tyrus Tom, T tyrus thomas slander allowed he did send sheldon williams and jj reddick home um and we will always be thankful for his service to the country um all right so shall we dive directly into jolly yeah let's do it all right so tell me about what you would consider the five most important uh, evaluation points for uh, Joel Ayi. So specifically, we're going to be looking at the tournament game of Gonzaga versus UCLA, and there are five things that kind of stood out to me during that game. Uh, one of it, one of those aspects was uh, gravity attention, whether it was off the ball or three point gravity. Uh, the other is how he reads the game, just when something happens, where are his eyes, and how is he reacting to it? Is he making the correct decision? Um, another aspect is how he has a natural inclination to kind of dive into the paint, whether it's a transition 
opportunity or offensive rebounding opportunity, uh, especially on the defensive boards, which is a little bit surprising, especially when in the modern NBA, guys kind of spread out to the corners instead of being, instead of just diving to the paint. Uh, we're going to focus on his uh, relocation and his defensive help uh, off the corner. I was surprised how little he digged on post players or helped out from that particular side. But then again, I've been watching a ton of Chris Duarte lately, so that might have shaded my opinion of him. Yeah, uh, Ayayi is is a fantastic uh, archetype of player where like you kind of you get to see them have flash moments where you know they can do more, but they're also producing winning. Um, oftentimes yeah. we have the opposite circumstance in, in draft evaluation where players are on bad or like I would say ugly teams and mm -hmm. you have to be like, no, they're better than their circumstance. And, and Ayayi is a fun archetype where he's on a really good team and you're like, no, but he could be even better. Yeah. Um, so um, with that being said, let's dive into this game that I'm sure that um, will not get copyright claimed. Why do you ask? Um, <laughs> Still there, Mike? You want me to talk through it, or you want you want um, me to drive? No, I, 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 like I said, it's been a while since oh, yeah. I saw this. Oh yeah, play, absolutely so not. Like, you were one of the first to get clips in, absolutely and completely. Get your bearings. So, and um, so yeah, if we rewind back, it's just a straight pick and roll situation, and I just was focusing on, hey, it's a hard hedge. He looked at option one as the dive man and just swung quickly over to the to the lift, mm -hmm. and um, I mostly focused on his particular season this year since he was off the ball, but. Just to show, hey, he's an on-ball creator too. This is kind of what it looks like, generally speaking, and just taking it from there. Yeah, I mean, you picked a uh, a really high leverage game. Um, you know, I generally when I'm doing these, I try to stay away from these because they're ratcheted up. But this also, this is the rare uh, like NCAA tournament game that didn't feel overcoached, and you could like yep. tell who players like are in that sense. So I feel like uh, of the of the tournament ones, I think this is one of the better examples of of who guys are. Right, so this last play over here, um, we see Ayayi basically curl all the way around, and he's just dragging Johnny Juzang all over the court, which this is just off-ball that I don't see as a Laker fan, which is really sad to say. Mm -hmm. But notice he's going from corner to corner, and then as soon as the ball is in the entry, Johnny is kind of already staring at Timmy, and then as soon as Johnny tilts his head, Ayayi is already diving straight into the paint, and you can see that, hey, even when, as well, as soon as Johnny's turning his head, he's already diving straight into the paint as well. Mm. He's I just mean, not afraid to actually do that and just follow through on relocating altogether or just trying to be opportunistic off the ball, which is just rare, rare for me to see from, generally speaking. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, he's the best cutter in this draft. Um, he's yeah. certainly the most relentless cutter in this draft. Um, possessions where he has 10 cuts are like, I mean, <laughs> depending on how you break it up, he just has action after action after action after action. Um, certainly a lot to cover. Yeah, uh, if anything, uh, one of the things I saw throughout this game was how many times just Chusang just turned around and he just went by him every single time. Here, I think this is more... Um, just trying to read how he's supposed to react to the to the coverage overall. Mm -hmm. And you can see how he goes straight into the paint, puts a little elbow on the big, and then you can say right there he's in at least rebounding position, assuming it's not a dead play. Yeah. I mean that's a that's a tough one because you you're you have the responsibility of the of the weak side and the dig underneath and being in two places at once is one of those things that has proven to be quite hard. Um, he does a good job of, of maintaining both responsibilities without really committing to one or the other. Yeah, and then here it's going through pick and roll again. I think he got surprised a little bit. Um, I think he saw someone helping out in the paint. There were two men in the paint when he actually uh, committed to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, as soon as he saw that, and then he saw his uh, left side covered as well. That's when he threw the turnover. It was just an aspect that I wanted to pay attention to. Yeah, I don't. I think that he has a lot of pick and roll passes. I do think he struggles no. a little bit with that weak side skip. Like in yeah. in rhythm off the bounce, like right hand right there. That's where the ball should be out. Yep. And and again, like he's a good passer, but that doesn't necessarily mean he has every pass in his bag. Um, oh yeah, I love this particular setup. Yep, go into a nice little curl. 
dribble entry. All yeah. the Gonzaga guys are really good at post entry. You can tell that they like take a pride in getting the ball in. Um, and then they run the, the little tice, the tie seal. The the strong side action is what like the engagement of of Juzang is what ends up like relieving the the weak side or the strong the weak side help or the weak side becoming strong side help. Yeah, I, I mean, I really just wanted to point out this play, not just because of uh, off-ball movement and leading to a defensive switch where Juzang actually ends up helping out in the paint, but also just to show that, hey, he's constantly just trying to create opportunities, whether he's open available to the ball or just trying to create opportunities to people who have the ball to get uh, to optimize the possession overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a transition opportunity where he's just diving to the paint. And usually, like I said, we usually see guys dive straight to the corners. And you can see Ayayi's slightly at the top end of the screen. Instead of running out to the corner and all four UCLA guys are in the paint, where is he? He's following up the shot instead. Not typical for a point guard to actually do that. Uh, I'm just happy to see a guy that's willing to commit and actually follow up on the shot instead of just saying, hey, sure, you could open up the spacing a little bit. Kind of just depends on the situation, but Ayayi has this natural, natural inclination to, to just be in the paint, whether it's defensive rebounding or in this case, just following up a shot. It's also really interesting to me to see like the angles he takes. Like a lot of guys, when they rim run, especially his wings, it's just straight to the front of the rim. And if he goes straight to the front of the rim, he does not get this opportunity. He first, he goes wide and then Timmy yep. is going to pop. It's either Timmy or Kispert. Kispert's going to pop. And so he sort of, he wides out. So then he, they do need wides a rim out, runner. Yep. And so he's, he like, sneaks in it's not right down the middle it's just on a slight angle and that's what presents that late flip in and like that's a cutting sense of just like knowing when to arrive late knowing when to arrive at an angle that AI presents over and over and over again yeah that slight delay is everything right mm -hmm. so here it was a shot fake he kicked back out and then as soon as he kicked back out uh Juzang was caught again he backdoored Juzang. Juzang caught up. Um, Ayayi eventually relocates, thinks he knows it's an open shot. It's a hit three. So yeah. here we go. I mean, like, Juzang is a fine player, but, like, in terms of if you are, are not an attentive defender or you have a habit of ball watching, this is this is hell. Again, yeah. backdoor. Like, this <laughs> could have been a bucket. Would... And then, like, yep. okay, now you have a kick out. Oh, now I have a corner rotation. And then they're just going to lift him, you know. And then from... even if you just freeze it for a second, actually just take it back. Um, down to where, right here. Um, just a second before this, Ayani is actually comfortable in the post. That was something I was unfamiliar with as uh, just observing him altogether. So he was here laying out an opportunity to say, hey, you know, I'm still a 6'5 guard. Yeah, I'll take Tiger Cam Campbell in the post. But Gonzaga went from that idea, and even then, he still relocated to the three-point line and then still got the good shot off anyway. Yeah, I... The amount of different actions he presents, like oftentimes when we think of, of good role players on a on a good team, it's guys who do a specific thing well. Um, like, I mean, I think of Danny Green on the North Carolina teams where it's like he did two things. He did. He, he was great in transition defense and he was just mm -hmm. super active. The shooting came and went a little bit, but like those those were the things he did. And like with a he's presenting so many different facets, even in like the, the you know, 10 minutes of gameplay we've, we've flipped through now. Or like you just see him going doing new things pretty regularly and allows you to be, you know, to adjust that usage allocation depending on where he goes in, in that like late first or, or mid second round. Yeah. And then here he is. Can't play shots already up. Look at that. It's a ton of space too. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Dig on the help. Just a touch late. Yep, and then here's the uh, here's just a replay of, of how difficult a lift that is. He he glides into it pretty easy <laughs> with the one two. Like that's again, Gonzaga was capable of just asking terrible questions uh, of defenses. Um, I, I can I, yeah. I've said it I've said it once. I've said it a billion times. Dig with two hands. No one ever calls it a foul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna need to see this for a third All time. Right. Let's jump no. in. Stagger. Yeah, see, yeah, just clearing out all along the baseline. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, it's interesting. And the way, frees up a lane right there. Yeah, it's interesting that they keep uh, shifting him along like the dunker spots, but as a way of, of searching yeah. for high lows. Like it's not it's not that he's going to catch it in on one step. It's that like he presents a tactical problem of like it's a guard making decisions in a dangerous position. Um, and so like when he does lift out of it, like you're, you're you know, you're thinking of it from the normal spot of like, oh, at the dunker spot, I can help this far. And then you have a guard making decisions on the perimeter. Oh, just off. And even. Left. Yeah. I just like how he creates those lane opportunities, you know, just in relation to the ball position in the half court. And I think that part of spacing is so vital. I mean, I've just watched offenses full of traffic the whole year, and then now I'm just watching Gonzaga over again, but watching the key guy who's the uh, an integral part of what makes that work. I'm just back. Huh. Yeah, I think this kill. is a, yeah, this is Ayayi just reading from afar and how quickly he reacts to the ball. It was kind of surprising to me. Like, sure, he's uh, eyeballing it from, what, 20, 30 feet away. But as soon as the ball is free, he's already jumping into the lane. I think that's what caught my eye in, in this specific play. So here it is, right? Yep. I mean, coming soon, up. Yep. The second the, the ball is killed, he's already, like, thinking about what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, the two ways of sort of thinking about a dribble kill is that like, um, you know, you can relax a little bit because nothing super bad is going to happen or you can, yep. it's your time to be really aggressive because like super bad things can happen for them. Um, for a player who's seen as broadly like pretty conservative, it's a, it's interesting to see how he does have that ball hawking, ball hawking sensibility when there is an oppor like an opportunistic uh, presentation. So um, there's one thing that I wanted to ask you about Ayayi's development. Did he have prior development as a big before? Because I've just noticed these tendencies of him just, as we've mentioned before, just playing around in the paint, being comfortable in that area. In this case, it's help rotation, right? He's taken on the big, shows mm -hmm. some verticality. And then when he's defending the post again, he's defending the pass on the mm -hmm. hands as opposed yeah. to directly behind the body. And yeah, it's a bit of a gamble, but if you're getting a deflection, depending on the angle of the pass onto the hands, that's to me, that's where the gamble, especially for a guard his size. Well, I mean, luckily we have a, a correspondent, a uh, well-versed, uh, along. <laughs> yes, feel you, free, man. <laughs> feel free yeah. to, to, to jump in. Cause I've only seen him. Uh, I believe that U19 was like the first time I really like, I mean, yeah. I may have heard the name, but. Uh, this is the, the from my that was my first exposure. So, what can you tell us about his uh his his youth youth development? He's cool. Yeah, played U eighteen before, so he's, he he was at INSEP, which was the the factory of young talent in France. Yves Pons also was there. It's a multi sports uh, platform where they they are trained, and then he he accepted the uh, of a scholarship from Gonzaga. He was always like when I saw him like U18 was always like yeah bigger but by by his height not by his uh, not by his uh, his looks I would say he was like all the dead over the, the the opponents but not bigger I would say but he has a huge basketball background his um, sister is playing uh, for the French Olympic team. Uh, French Olympic basketball. He has also a brother who played professionally, so he's uh, he's in the real like basketball family and has always like been driven to to become a professional basketball player. Yeah, I'm just happy to see you know guards just going to be in the paint, show some physicality yeah. out there, and then have it as a complementary skill to everything else they do on the floor. And you can tell he's comfortable on all sides of floor, especially the painted area, and not just roaming around, you know, doing cardio along the perimeter. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it, it's almost comical that he finishes a possession where he, you know, exhibits three or four post skills, um, including yeah. getting a, a well-timed post possession. And his first instinct is to run, like, rim to rim. Um, yeah. That is uh, like it's very fitting, and that rim run is what allows this uh, 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 attempt to not be like a real charge. Because if he flares oh. wide, then that then I think that uh, Juzang is perfectly positioned for the charge because he doesn't have to move that extra step. So 
Ayahi uh, has a like it, he's not going to play the five, but the ability to within an offense operate from the same positions that that would be expected, whether it's the dunker spot or, you know, not immediately sprinting to corner um, playing with 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 a, 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 an interchangeability of, of positions. It's very uh, it's very cool to see. And I feel like as a, as a not the driver of Gonzaga's success, but definitely enables them to play some of their funkier lineups. Yeah, it's just fun to see those general big man skills after watching, you know, Kessler. You watch Kessler Edwards, and then you can see his big man skills shine, kind of how he moves around the floor, especially how he protects the paint. You see Ayayi do it in, in other ways as well, and it's not directly always a block shot. It's, hey, I'm going to recover. I'm going to uh, defend the big man. I'm going to contest this pass from behind. I know what angle to actually do and, and use my leverage as much as possible to push him or at least hold in the paint. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so here I think he was kind of caught in no man's land. And you see the you see the big already in the paint and he was already shading over when the pass mm -hmm. was was coming in. Let me know if you want me to stop at any point. Sure. So Big is gonna go into the paint. You see Ayayi already shading over, trying to meet him at the at the circle. And as soon as he reads that Timmy's gonna recover, he tries to recover back to the corner. And then right here is just kind of no man's land where it's either you have to com fully commit to the guy in the paint and try and contest a shot, or just get go to the corner at least and then let Timmy, you know, hold up defensively. Yeah, I think he might have thought it was a travel because I certainly did. Um... <laughs> sure. <laughs> I love how how seamlessly the Gonzaga guards interchange. Like every time there's a post touch, just dudes around the perimeter. You know, it can be a shuffle cut. It could be so many different options. But they just continue oh, right to here. Move. Yeah. No, I, I mean, once again, he's just uh, moving off ball. You even see him in the dunker spot, floating along the baseline, and just making himself available to that possible opportunity is actually there. Yeah. Like this, I mean, is sort of supposed to be a, a middle ball screen. They ended up, you know, rejecting it and, and then, you know, flowing into a post up. But like if you just watch how much AI moves, you know, it, it's corner to dunker spot to corner. Now he's shaking up to the slot. You know, uh, now we've lifted up to the top. We have a double interchange. We Then we have a, yeah. a small flash. And like it's just these are presenting angles that make Timmy's life easier. I mean, he did. It's not helped by uh, some of the choices that Terry made, but just like the worst thing you can do for a big is give them like a flat defense to have to read. Um, yeah. Joel Embiid somewhere nods knowingly. Um, <laughs> uh, but like that's in a lot of ways, your best friend is a guard who just like is, is searching angles, is forcing a defense to double check because, you know, one one wrong head move, it's a back cut or that's that's when the drop the drop spin comes out. Yeah, I, this particular play, I know uh, Timmy missed a shooter behind the arc and after he missed him it was uh it was yayu who's actually available in the painted area just for a brief moment but to me missed him there too nice little maggetti oh, cut yeah. yep once again it's catching the ball looking like he's in post position just making the read This one's interesting. Like the, it, it, it's not. It doesn't end up being fruitful on the play, but just like trying to find those little extra seams. You know, you have a if if Juzang is going to double, cutting behind makes the double harder. Yeah, that makes that and, would mean that and, Tiger has the top two, and that's a that's a difficult rotation. And I mean, you could just kind of see it happen if Kispert actually just drops the ball off to a Yayu. That's a floater, right? Yep. I mean, it's just right in the paint. Oh, I had to have one Ayayi scoring highlight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as opposed to the off-ball movement clinic we've had, where it's just like, wow, he shook so well. It's like, somebody else has scored like 30 points. <laughs> yeah. I was just like enjoying his ability to accelerate from that far out and just yeah. catching defenses a little bit off guard. Yep, I got the uh, I got the alternate angle on this one, too. Nice little ball fake. Extend, yep. scoops it out, just avoids the hands. The shielding is totally cool. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A, 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 an, an MBA acceptable amount of shielding. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, 
does it does it feel like we are underrating like in general both i mean i is an avatar with this but like the soft skills that that connecting wing prospects have where they're good at a lot of things they're probably not particularly valuable to bad teams and i mean isn't it value to bad teams is quite often how like mock drafts and, and big boards are, are built um is this sort of prospect who presents as a as a multitude of ways and, and is kind of a a swiss army knife and not to use too much of a, a cliche is that like something that gets overlooked because there isn't a particular superlative skill um i think it gets overlooked but considering the league is just leaning towards lead initiators who are six six or taller and a lot of point cards are just generally getting taller overall and you see guys like obviously lebron but then there's also jokic and, and everyone else these complementary guards who work well off the ball and flash those uh big man abilities, you know, covering the post, helping out on defense, diving into the paint. All those skills should at least be more highly rated, especially for the for the correct uh, team context. And there's a lot more of those teams at the NBA level now than there has been before. So depending, of course, the context is, especially for this given draft, you know, I mean, obviously for the Lakers, oh, well, you have an off, off ball guard next to LeBron who has three point gravity, great. You know, the other skills with helping out in the paint and reacting to the ball when it's at the rim is especially helpful. And, you know, just part of this process with Ayayi, I really enjoyed seeing the multitude of skills and not just specifically the off-ball stuff, which was super fun to watch overall, but just the kind of gravity he was also drawing just off movement. Every time Tuseng just turned his head, he was gone. And... There's not a lot of guys that just do that. You know, usually guys just park at corners and it's just uh, an enjoying to see that overall. Yeah. Um, let's throw it to the group. Any any takeaways, anything that do you feel, you know, undervalued, overvalued, things we might have hit on, not enough, too much? I think it's it was really, really interesting. And for me, like the first big, big watch I had on IA was as you said before, U19, where he was only on ball, played on ball, pick and roll creator, uh, shot like 16 times per, per game, scored more than 20 points on the, he was named on the um, best five of the U19 tournament with like Tyrese Aliburton and other players. Mm -hmm. He was like the main leader of friends, the main leader of friends. And after that, we said, yeah, maybe he, we were not, he was not, efficient enough in this world but he had to he had to be that leader for the for the team and that's that was interesting now to see another world for him another context in NCAA close closer I suppose to his NBA NBA world and but he, he has and he, he, he is a good like he show, he showed at the youth at the young age pick and roll flashes as a ball handler so mm -hmm. Is I think he's capable of doing some of like tertiary creation for an NBA bench, I would say. Yeah, in the, when he's like maybe older. Yeah, I think it says a lot about a guy who's able to kind of just change in his archetype in the middle of a tenured career, right? I saw this a little bit with uh, Steph Curry, especially his last year at Davidson, where he just became more of an on ball creator. And now this is the flip side of it where it's, okay, I'm being relieved of some usage and ball handling ability. How can I make myself effective? And we see a Yai just do it at an incredibly high level. Uh, I'm curious, Mike, if or anyone else in the group, if you think that, you know, maybe we've sort of underrated him as a ball handler because he did have, he was finished in the 99th percentile of pick and roll ball handling according to Synergy. I think it took up like... 15 to 20 percent of his possessions not a huge number obviously did not operate at a big usage rate and gonzaga had a terrific team context for him to make the most of those opportunities when he did find the ball in his hands uh but just given the fact that his signature skill seems like cutting i'm, I'm wondering if you think maybe uh, his initiation is maybe a little underplayed or if you think you know that's not an uh, area where he projects to make an impact in the league um, I mean, personally, I think his impact is with this current role with Gonzaga now. But then again, I think that just speaks to how incredibly high a level of skill, athletic, and size is required at the NBA just to be an elite initiator 
in the first place, right? If if I don't see Derek Fisher and I see this guy, I'm taking this guy a thousand percent. I just saw Derek Fisher sit at corners and he was great for hitting really clutch shots. But at the same time, we could have used a lot more transition ability, uh, just some, any kind of gravity off the ball. Just there's a lot of issues that at least I've seen for the team uh, I'm I'm covering that he covers, he does those things and he does it at such a high level. It makes me wonder, well, I know I'm overrating his off ball ability, but I like him so much because this is the kind of player I think that NBA overall just needs more of, and there just isn't enough of them. Ricky, I think that's a, that's a fantastic like way of phrasing it. Because for me, the thing, the question that I've come hung up on is like, he's a very good shooter. And I wonder how much versatility, like in terms of like exploring the studio space of like how much momentum can you have him come off of? Can he shoot off the dribble at any kind of volume? And like, it, he doesn't need to become a primary, but like, I mean, we've seen, and this is probably like, you know, comparing a, a little bit over his head is like, we've seen Halliburton's ability to like, not necessarily need to put a huge amount of rim pressure, but just like the ability to add that extra dimension of gravity of shooting off the dribble has changed his usage profile in the NBA, where in college, uh, it felt like if teams could crowd him off the dribble, he really struggled because he just couldn't get to the cup. Um, I don't think he necessarily has to have a ton of, of primary usage, but just adding that shooting versatility would really change how he's closed out on and probably open up the chances for him to to showcase a little bit more of the passing. And if that's true, then like that is a, a very strong potential avenue towards winning basketball. Um, any so, last thoughts on EA? Well, I've got a question as well. So a lot of what we've talked about here has been in the context of Gonzaga, right? Uh, Do you think there's Jay, any... I'm, I'm getting a little, or Jeff, I'm getting a little bit of buzz from you. Uh, oh, it might be sorry. a bad connection from your headphones. Can, like, can, can you understand me or is it just... Yeah, we can. It's just, it's just a little bit. I can try to put some noise damp. No, it's not that bad now. Okay, you're good. Oh, okay. It might be a fan maybe, potentially. That, yeah, that may, that may be the air conditioning. I'll yeah, I think between, be. Uh, between segments. Um, but yeah, so talked a lot about his context to Gonzaga. To what extent? Like one of the first things we said is okay, he's really good in this context, but he might be even better in the NBA. To what extent do you also think like I I is it purely okay? There's only upside from here, or is there also like the possibility of okay? Well, we've seen like Zach Norvell, for example, be in the same context, be like this excellent play finisher, this excellent cutter, and then struggle to translate that to the NBA. Is there any chance of that really coming into play or is it just like, I think okay, that we've well, seen, I think that my personal read is that we've seen more context from him and him be successful in a number of different roles. Um, that like, for me, the, like the multiple context, like the, for me, the scariest type of guys like struggle, 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 like relative struggle. And then awesome in a particular role. And like, I don't think there'll ever be a schematic advantage in the NBA as similar to what Gonzaga had in terms of just like firepower and the ability to force really difficult rotations. But like, it wasn't like he was, you know, a mediocre prospect in a primary role or even like a, a, a lesser secondary role. Um, I thought he did well. It's just a matter of uh, like, it. it's probably not this good, but even like 80% of this is like an extraordinarily valuable NBA player who like you also probably are never going to have to max. Um, Ricky, since you have a hard out, do you want to jump to you just to, to keep everybody safe? Sure. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, just because I'm sitting in this chair for, for 10 hours doesn't mean I've completely lost track of perspective. All right. Uh, let's jump to uh, the enigma, the mystery, the movement skills of uh, Kai Jones. So, Ricky, if you were to say, what are the five, uh, like, what are the, what are the five ideas or, or five, like, things that the evaluation of Kai Jones like depends on like if you see him this way it's this interpret this however you feel just sure I think uh, you know the first thing I notice about him is that he runs the floor super well I believe he graded out as excellent in terms of his transition scoring ability uh, movement skills are just really interesting to me long strides I would say in the open floor is super dangerous we're going to see a clip in this game uh, it's one of his best clips of the year in my opinion where he euro steps a defender in transition finishes with a dunk you just don't see too many guys who are a half inch shorter than seven foot uh, be able to pull off that type of coordination in the open floor so I think uh, just the intersection of his size and his movement ability is pretty interesting 
Uh, playing off that, I think that he has a pretty unique ability to attack a defense that isn't set yet. Uh, now, a lot of that is going to come down to his like play recognition and sort of how he's processing the game. I think that that play processing is, you know, one of the big question marks hanging over him as a prospect. But on cuts, uh, he was he was really good on cuts. You see his ability to like actually attack a little bit off straight line drives. Again, not a lot of people at that size have that. So I think, you know, when a defense isn't totally set yet, when they're not loaded up, when he gets the ball with an advantage created for him, uh, I think that, you know, that is something that's pretty intriguing about him. Uh, back to the movement skills, I think on the perimeter, there'll, there'll be a clip in this game where he sort of stonewalls Culver against West Virginia, gets a charge call. I, I think it's interesting how... He slides on the perimeter. Uh, obviously, it's a big question for a lot of bigs transitioning from college to the NBA. Unfortunately, we don't typically get a ton of clips of college big men defending in space just because of the way the floor is balanced at the college level and because of the actions run. But I do think that he's got some some potential to step out on the perimeter, slide his feet, uh, and be uh, you know a guard who can hold his own on a switch for a few seconds. Uh, I'll also name his shooting potential. Uh, still very rough. I don't have, you know, so just just a raw player in general. I guess he hit uh, 30.8% of his threes this year, if my numbers are correct, but only took uh, 2.3 attempts per 40. So not a high-volume shooter. By no. any means. I wouldn't say he hit 13 three-pointers the whole year. I believe he, he took 58 his... the whole, his, his career at Texas. Yeah, but obviously freshman year didn't play very much. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but he has a very late blooming development arc where he was on track to be a long jumper from the Bahamas. Uh, even when he entered high school, didn't pick up basketball until he was about 15 years old, I believe. Of course, did the prep school year as well. So he was someone who's just like really starting to grow into the game. And because of that, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of these skills, while they might be rough, uh, you know, you can talk about it with this feel as well. But, you know, it's just enticing. I think it's part of what has given him lottery hype, despite, you know, some glaring uh, some glaring mistakes on the tape throughout the season and, you know, some numbers that are a little scary too. And then, yeah, I think just some sort of, like, shot creation upside is interesting too with him. Like, I don't know. Uh, like, he's certainly not at an Evan Mobley level, but after Mobley, in terms of the bigs in this class, for a guy who's six foot eleven, uh, I think that you know just because of his physical talent, he has a little bit of shot creation upside. So that's that's mostly what I was looking at in the film with him. Yeah. Uh, so he sounds like he could be anything, um, and that's sort of the allure. It's also the danger. Is that a is that a succinct way of saying it? Absolutely. Okay, well, let's dive into it. I'm very excited because, uh, boy, oh boy, are there a wide swath of opinions about Kai Jones. <laughs> okay, so on this one, trying to front the post on Culver. Culver, obviously a beast of an interior scorer. And Kai's got no chance. Uh, you saw that throughout this game at the start of the game. Uh, he really couldn't hold his own down low in the paint. So he was consistently trying to like front the post, front Culver. And these are the type of bigs, you know, he's going to be guarding in the NBA, like big, strong dudes who could basically bury him under the basket. Culver just crushes him here. And uh, there's a few more clips in this game. One of them I laughed out loud when I watched it. But, so, you know, similar to this one, just gets overpowered down low mm -hmm. uh and you know one thing i'm thinking with kai this is zooming out a little bit but it's like you know is he strong enough he, he has this enticing mix of skills right this great size uh really really impressive athleticism the potential to possibly play you know close to the basket and away from the basket but then you wonder like is he really skilled enough to play away from the basket? And is he really big and strong enough to play near the basket? Maybe he's a guy who could do neither of those things instead of both of those things. Uh, and I think just this clip in general is sort of uh, perhaps representative of what he's, you know, the type of bigs he's going to see in the NBA in terms of dudes who could bury him under the basket. All right, so here, yeah, we just get, you know, I felt like he was in position to get this rebound. He just sort of gets overpowered. Ball gets ripped away from him. Uh, call goes, 
to West Virginia. So you can watch him here and uh, it's like in position to get the weak side rebound. Given his size and stuff, he should be able to like pull this down, right? Kind of gets ripped away from him with one arm, I think. So uh, obviously in a situation, especially if he's going to be five, you got to pull down that rebound. Here, I thought this was, this was interesting. Uh, pretty good body control on the up and under. Nice timing on the cut. Um, you know, do you want him to just try to overpower his way to the basket there, draw the foul? Maybe, but just being a guy that big and show off that type of body control, uh, get a good attempt at the rim, didn't go in. But, you know, part of what makes him unique, I think, is that level of body control in the air. Couldn't get the finish there, but still sort of emblematic of the type of prospect he is. Let's see what we got here. Nice closeout. Oh, this is the signature play. Nice closeout leads to the miss there. Immediately leaks out, takes off down the floor. And then, yeah, he's got the guy on an island, one on O. He's defending the rim, and he hits him with the arrow, finishes with the dunk. To me, that was one of his signature plays of the entire season. I think that, uh, you know, his transition scoring as a big is something that's particularly intriguing about him. And yeah, when he gets in this type of single coverage, when he's got a lot of space to work with against a smaller defender, just going right around him with the footwork looks really polished, especially for a guy who hasn't been playing the game that long. I yeah. think that's, that's a really beautiful play uh, here. Nice cut, nice cut, but dude, you got to finish this one. I mean, I think he had the, he, he recognized the time and the space of when to move towards the basket. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, he's got a smaller defender being the only guy near the rim when he initially catches the ball. To me, this has got to be a strong finish. Instead, he turns back uh, to the top of the key. The help comes, and it's the play is basically dead on arrival. I feel like he totally blew the advantage in this situation created by his teammate. It's kind of a weak uh, attempt at the rim, too. Again, you could see sort of his issues finishing through contact. So, uh, yeah. you know, I mean discouraging play. I mean, it's interesting because like he, I think that there's like sort of two things happening here. The first one is like, he is, uh, uncomfortable with contact, but he's also like not, he's not seeking collisions. And I think that like you brought up Tyrus Thomas earlier and like, oh boy, are we not here to relitigate Tyrus Thomas? But like Tyrus Thomas had issues with contact, but Tyrus Thomas sought collisions. And if you were between him and the rim, he was going to try to put you inside the rim. And I think that Kai Jones can do that on occasion but he hasn't either like got the mentality or even has like the the net the footwork right now to consistently do it because like they'll have moments like this where like this one he is trying to like really punch it on somebody and this mentality is is much better than what we've seen previously but uh yeah he does get a nice forearm shiver to the head um that being said like this is the best like mentality with with the guys who are newer to the game you always kind of wonder if they have like that you know true desire to like annihilate people that you know it, it feels like comes that the, the guys who've played their whole lives kind of are sort of seem to have a little bit more of ingrained but like this is the positive stuff that really encourages me even though it, it gets called a travel like after two sort of weaker attempts the third one he's like no i'm going strong with two off two and like, i hope he's one of these type of players who like can be a next play player doesn't get in his head too much uh, I don't have any insight into that. I don't know if anyone else on the panel does or in the chat, but, uh, you know, I just feel like watching the league over the last four or five years covering young players. Some guys just have a tough time, like, moving on to the next play. That's an example where he just gets crushed by Culver under the rim, potentially is an embarrassing play. But as you noted, like, you know, you like the mentality there, trying to go up strong, even though it didn't work out for him. So that, that'll be something interesting to monitor. And then here, yeah, we have him. So he gets the spot up three here, I believe, on this Yeah, on, the, on the inverted pick and pop. Yeah, inverted pick and pop, misses it. Take, I think he's got, a, he's got a pretty long release. I don't know if yeah. you've seen that PD throughout your tape watching, but misses the three here, ends up uh, getting it back. And I sort of like the bend on this drive. I mean, you have a more trained eye than I do, but I thought, you know, putting his head down, getting to the basket, being able to attack in a straight line drive, Certainly a little out of control there. It's just limbs flying everywhere, but yeah. uh, some soft touch to finish that, right? And uh, Yeah. I mean, the the thing that, like, the, the jumper is kind of three motions. Um, like, there's the really long gather phase. Then we go up, and then it's out from there. So kind of like two and a half. 
they need some smoothing, but overall, like it doesn't look bad for somebody who's pretty new to basketball. Um, the drive looks fantastic until the last step. Like he's really low. Um, you know, they, dudes who are almost seven feet tall aren't supposed to move like this. And then you get to the last step and it's just, there's no explosion on that last one. What separates a lot of, you know, uh, the guys who have movement skills from the guys who can, you know, do something with them in, in the paint is that last step being as violent as the first one. Um, and I think that there's a, a lot of like there's the, obviously like that not being present right now doesn't isn't an indictment. It just means that like there's specific biomechanical stuff that he's going to have to work on to make that last step really pop rather than it getting caught around his waist. Yeah, and building off that, my uh, former colleague Mike Prada wrote a really brilliant breakdown on Luka Doncic's last step. Uh, a couple of years ago, you can find that on SB Nation if you Google for it. Luca obviously was often getting dinged for his lack of an explosive first step, but Prada in that breakdown really showed how important the last step is. So I think that, uh, you know, you nailed that there too, no surprise. And then here, this is just uh, him drawing a charge. I oh, yeah, let me pull it back. I, I want okay. one ahead. I mean, it's not the most uh, revealing play, but again, you know, he's got Culver on the perimeter. Culver's like, I'm going to blow through this dude. Slides his feet, gets the charge. Kind of a weak call, probably, but he did beat him to the spot, I think. Yeah. So, I think uh, that, I think the ref thought that Culver was going to really lay him out. And then you know, once you start that charge motion, you kind of can't call it off. You've committed to the whole... Like, look, that's a big charge motion. I think we can all agree this ref really sold the charge. That's a that's a full two piece wind up and a follow through. That's a Hadouken charge call. Joe uh, West style punch out right there. Yeah, I'm the second guy to make a baseball reference on this stream. Uh, but you know when you're talking about him potentially moving his feet on the perimeter, that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Now here he's on the perimeter again. He's sort of in a compromised position by the time the West Virginia ball handler starts his drive. You'd see him like shuffle his feet a little bit as soon as he gets engaged as the defender. Uh, but, you know, not terrific perimeter defense. You'll see, I think, yeah, so the ball's going to slide here. Uh, yeah, you see that little hop. Get, yeah. Dude goes left on him. Uh, you would like to think his athleticism, general athleticism and length, would be able to get a better contest in that situation. Instead, again, you see his arms just sort of flailing. Not a particularly good contest, in my opinion, but... Mm -hmm uh you know it's also targeting like that that jumping while moving backwards is a real glute heavy thing and it's like while he is like very athletic and, and has good movement skills in a lot of ways this is kind of targeting where his physical weaknesses are which is that that like that back end kinetic chain and like he gets close but it's it's a swipe because he knows he's probably not going to get it off for it uh here we got some floppy of course <laughs> um I, I like his ability to like run in space. The closeouts can be a little hit or miss, but like he's moving like fairly guardly. I know it's not a word, but like it, it, he doesn't look like a giant dude stumbling around, around like, you know, single and double screens. Uh, yeah, I believe yeah, this is my, this is my moment for him. This is, this is one of the plays uh, that I would say defines his year. He gets a solid box out. Uh, and then he out sprints Sprint three dudes it. and then uh, puts his headband on a backboard. Yeah, so quick off the floor, uh, very long strides, I would say. Really can run the floor well. Can we get a race between him and Rock Wiseman? Just, uh, you know, 100 meter dash. That could be pretty fun to see who runs the floor better. Because uh, I, I like him, you know, in the open court for sure. And then quick off the ground, too. You did, I didn't see a lot of double jump attempts in this mm -hmm. game. So I'd be interested to, you know, dig into that a little further. Um, just as a rebounder and putback guy. But this was, this sort of shows how he can make an impact, I think, early in the league. Is being yeah. a big who can run the floor ferociously. And as long as he's programmed to play that way, you can get yourself 10 easy points a game, probably just, uh, you know, running yeah. hard to him like that in transition. I just want to see, like, can we get him and Wiseman and then, like, can we call up Adam Bona for this? Because Adam Bona runs in in in, uh, in transition like a super soldier. Like, I've never, I've on, almost never seen a big person run as fast as Adam Bona did in, like, these three clips from U19 where he probably was like, <laughs> he's just like, my dunk, and then I ran three guards to go get a dunk. How big is he? He's like 6'10", oh, 6'11". No. Cool. But you know, uh, built like a Kansas player. That's what I'll say. Like, he's just like those stockier, uh, 
Like he's not doke size, but he's he's not a small dude. Um, here we I see it again. He, again, yeah. he's running hard. Running this time, he's running a wing lane, which is a, it's a it seems like a similar skill set, but it's not a hundred percent. I I I think I cut this one in just because uh, I like seeing how guys process space. Like here, you know, he doesn't really have the center lane. Um, like we just talked about with a Yai, alternating which lanes you're running is is a specific you know spatial skill. You know, if he goes towards the middle, he can overlap with Greg, and then they can just run that hard double at Greg. And there is a moment where he, that baseline pass was available. He 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 figures that out, like which is a good sign for a guy who's who's pretty new to basketball. Yeah, and again, there I had this one marked down too, just like trying to front the post mm -hmm. defensively. Uh, you know, do you think that's viable in the league to be consistently trying to front the post like that? Uh, probably not. I mean, like, I, I think that like you'd give it, you don't want him to go like a 50, 50 where like, you're discouraging. You have a little bit of help over top, but like, ideally you kind of want him to be the secondary rim protector where like he can charge up. Cause like his athleticism is not super phone boothy. It's like, give him a step and, and let him like charge up on a leg, like stuff like this. He's not, he, we just saw him like, uh, you know, uh, off a of hop going backwards off too. And it wasn't anywhere close to that level of explosion. And then at about six strides, he makes it all the way down the court. Now, that is, that's a really great play, I think, because Culver had previously embarrassed him earlier in the game, probably multiple times with his strength and his mm -hmm. power. So that's Kai being like, all right, like, let's see what I can do to you. Being able to block that shot immediately takes off down the floor. It's not a particularly good pass. Like, I wonder how many no. bigs would even be able to corral this pass in the open floor like that. With one uh, hand. Yeah, one hand catches, finishes, looks pretty smooth and fluid in that motion. So uh, Kai's an interesting prospect, man. Like I threw out Tyrus as a guy. I, I would be really fascinated to know anyone else on the panel's uh, thoughts on just like who might some comps be. But the two names that came to mind for me so, uh, were him and Marquise Chris. Tyrus yeah. and Marquise Chris. Just Chris, was the, Chris was the one just from like, uh, I think we've talked about my Marquise Chris uh, uh, data, three point availability, um, bugaboo. Um, a thing I will say about Kai that like is really different than a lot of guys who are big striders is he jumps from really close to the rim. So like he's finishing this and both of his shoulders are under the rim. Like, I don't know if that's clear on the, on the smaller screen, but like he's shooting, like he's basically reaching across his body to lay this up. And he, if he can learn how to jump from farther, I mean, he's a guy who could easily, like, I, I would assume jump, jump from the, the outside of the, the big 12 logo, like really consistently, but you'll, you'll notice his last step is really close to the rim. And that's why he has so many circumstances where he's like hitting his head on the backboard because he's still going upwards as he's dunking. And ideally you want to do that on the way down. Um, Mobley, of course, has the stuff where he like literally tries to dunk it as fast as possible before help can come. But I think Kai is not doing this as an intentional strategy, just like he's not timing his steps correctly. Obviously, this one was a bad pass, but it's something to note about. Um, uh, it's something to note about, uh, you know, guys who are newer to the game and understanding spatial reasoning and also like just how far, just like what he can do at almost 6'11". Um, but yeah, I would love to hear what people have for comps for him. Yeah, just general Kai discussion. I told PD when I put this one down, I'm like, this is the type of dude who typically, honestly, I would put top five historically. Like, I would just uh, get too sucked in by the tools and I would get sucked in by the apparent upside and I would have him much higher than the consensus typically, historically. This year, I think when I did my big board, I put him 15. I kind of checked myself a little bit. Uh, watching the tape, I saw someone I mentioned. I saw something as I mentioned earlier that, like, you know, I don't, while he does have this mix of skills that could potentially function both on the interior and the perimeter, like he also has question marks in terms of where he could play on both ends of the floor uh, in both those spots. So uh, I do think he has upside. I really like his transition ability, but I'm not going to get too enticed by the flashes because his flash plays all season were like as good as anyone in this class besides for probably Mobley, maybe Cade. Um, yeah. Like, wh what do you guys think of Kai? Do you think he's a lottery pick? Would you not use a lottery pick in this draft on him? Uh, just curious what everyone thinks. So the first question we went to was uh, comp wise, where do I go with them? And I guess the question I would kind of pose is in terms of developing a comp for him, is there an interesting version of Kai that doesn't shoot? I would say probably not. Like maybe, 
maybe is a rim runner type, but I don't know if he really has that type of functional strength and athleticism to really like be playing with force and putting, you know, whatever pressure on the rim as a roller. And, and I, that, 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 that very much tracks with how I'm thinking of him, too. And that kind of perks comps because big men who shoot like that just don't exist in NBA history, right? Um, like, you know, you get to, okay, Richard Lewis. He's clearly not Richard Lewis. Yeah. I think we can eliminate that pretty safely. Um, and so, like, comp, comping him is hard because, yeah, there's not many guys like him in, in general. I, I struggle especially with I, – I generally view him as a poor passer, and I generally view him as an overall poor defender in spite of the movement skills. And so between that, like, I'm probably going to be the lowest one here on him. I have him, I think, 38th on my board. Um, yeah. And I think that's just one of those things where, like, he has to develop certain specific things that are really hard to develop. And I think that he's getting a lot of credit as a guy who has that weird developmental background, like we talked about, as a long jumper. Um, that, okay, he's only been playing basketball for so long, he's still learning. Yes, but a lot of the times what it is is that still learning – most guys are not still learning per se guys that we see like so for example Joel Embiid still learning is the wrong word I guess I would say it rather so you see like Joel Embiid Pascal Siakam they had these things that um they, they had these athletic backgrounds that previously developed diverse movement skills but also in conjunction with processing what's in front of them and long jumping doesn't really do that like long jumping your job is to jump um there's not that much strategic thought around it. and so my leaning is that it's going to be a lot harder for him to develop the things that he's missing um, and that there's some like weird development theory stuff going on there where because he's so raw it's yeah but I do think that like you're right the flash plays are just as completely absurd as anyone in this class is yet um, it's just that for him they come so inconsistently that it's really hard for me to buy in on them yeah and honestly like putting him in 38 i got no problem with that yep. he does seem like the type of guy who potentially could be out of the league pretty quickly i think like if he just gets eaten up and uh yeah <laughs> team wants to cut his losses quickly with him i wouldn't be surprised if kai jones is out of the league in five years so 38 i think is totally fair even though i have yep. him higher i mean i i think that like 14 for for me in this draft like between 15 and or like 20 and 45 is basically the same amount of dude. It's just about finding the right developmental environment. I will say that Texas or Shaka Smart, I won't say Texas because there's been a coaching change. Uh, Shaka Smart has a history of, uh, of turning bigs and wings into strict play finishers. And so like his passing indicators are pretty useless unless you're comparing them to other, um, to other uh, Texas guys. Like, he, but he's, he clearly has more passing than Jackson did. I think he's a better understander of like a better processor than Jarrett. Um, I think that um, I think that like the guys who you're going to find most comps for are dudes who had like ludicrous movement skills, but probably didn't like didn't work because the guys who have ludicrous like you basically have two choices. You can go to the top end where it's like this guy has the Ralph Sampson movement skills. Like obviously he's smaller, but like that's just not a fair comparison to lay onto a dude who's played for, you know, two and a half, three years or whatever. And the other choice is like the other side of comparisons where it's just like, uh, how do you feel about somewhere between like Anthony Randolph and Willie Colley Stein? And like, yeah. Colley Stein's a good one. Like those are two that you'll hear a bunch, but like, there's just not a middle ground of guys who have like, basically if you have like this level of movement skills, you either figure it out and, and turn into like the, the Pascal style, like though Pascal's movement skills are, are much more unique. They're not like, you know, a, a six eleven person who moves like a five eleven person. They're more like basketball specific. Um, I feel like you're basically have, you, if you're making, if you're in the comparison business, you can either go very, very, very top shelf or like, how do you feel about like a Gucci version of, you know, a, a player who probably didn't put it all together. Yeah. Uh, anybody have any that, other names? I have one maybe. Okay, I'm glad to hear this. Like it reminds me a little bit of a less creator but a more shooter Nick Claxton. Mm. A little bit of that. At the Nick Claxton, Nick Claxton the, the sophomore year at Georgia, like twenty nineteen eight. It reminds yeah. me a little bit of this. Yeah, I mean Claxton definitely checks the box of like I, I really, really, really didn't like Claxton's offensive processing. Like yeah. to the point where I like viewed him as only a rim runner. Um yeah. so I mean like if you are lower on the processing, I feel like that's a different point. I mean like Randolph 
for those of you who may be on the younger side, like had a potential equity to run some offense just because he was such a weird player. Um, I guess like maybe it's Abaka, like really like the the youngest version of Abaka, of like in terms of the movement skills, like the sometimes the the very rote decision making. Like I, again, comps are are a very uh, indelicate business, but yeah, I think Claxton's a, a very a one that I had not considered. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, if uh, Kai Jones had sort of Claxton's ability to corral the pick and roll and to play two is the only big man, I probably would have him even higher in this draft, even though yeah. I'm pretty high on Moretti. But uh, yeah, I you know, you just wonder like, so Claxton can play in lineups where he's the only big. Is Kai going to be able to do that? Uh, you're going to have to talk. Uh, that's going to be a, a conversation between uh, every team and its strength and conditioning people because, yeah. Um, I see more as a four, right? Especially yes, early I, I in do the too. He's going to need a strong defensive anchor next to him. He's going to be a guy who's going to be sort of like a help side rim protector, I guess, defensively, even though already that seems like an adventure is the words that are coming out of my mouth. But, uh, <laughs> Probably just capitalizing on, like, I, I believe our boy Ross termed phrase, maybe I'll, I'll give him credit for it, just like opportunistic scoring. And I think, like, yeah. he could maybe be someone who can just like buzz around the court and just get you some points off uh, running the floor hard, maybe attacking a closeout in some tight spaces, being like ridiculous once or twice per game, ridiculous plays per 48. So, yeah, I love watching Kai, man. It's, yeah. uh, I mean, it's a roller coaster, but. I don't know if I'd want him on my favorite team. Just watching him as a prospect, I think he's really fun to evaluate. And I think that uh, JNA over here had a pretty good sort of view on him with a more pessimistic lens that I yeah. think is also very fair. Um, yeah, if Ross, if Ross has some difficult, if Ross does not like that characterization, he can come on this show and talk to me about it. Uh, that's the only venue where I'll be taking Ross Elman criticisms. Um, <laughs> um yeah uh how are we feeling here um we we ready to move on we have more to in, interrogate on the kai jones question uh on the enigma on the mystery on the the big board dart throw i mean if, I, if you told me you had him like top three i'd be like i understand I, I don't i don't get it but i understand if you told me you had him like top 60 because you just didn't think you could teach ball scales i'd also get that it's I feel like this is the easiest uh, like shrug of the draft in terms of like where, you know, it, it, uh, big boards promote a certain type of outrage. And I feel like Kai Jones is one of the ones where you're like, no, nah, I get it. I, I, I really do. All right. Um, uh, Ricky, if you have to bounce at any point, just let me know. We can do your plugs. And and I know you do have a, a, a time lock. And if anybody, as always, if you if you have to go, you we're not here to hold you up. Um, just let me know. We can plug your stuff. And if you if you open up later in the evening, the door is open. Feel free to come back. Be a part of the peanut gallery. Uh, yell at me and tell me I'm a terrible MC or that I need to go to sleep, as many people have tried to tell me, and I just refuse. Um, okay. So up next, I believe we have uh, Samuel Hauser. Um, what would you say the five uh, essential ideas of, of Sam Hauser are? So honestly, there's a strong temptation to do a Dylan, 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 and Dylan joke uh -huh. here and just, no, just, just shoot, lean into shooting it. for all five. Yep, do um, it, do it. And yeah, <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll just go shooting, 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 and shooting here. Yeah. I didn't count that to know if it's actually correct, but yeah. Honestly, though, his game is actually a little bit more complex than that. He is a plus passer from a standstill, which isn't as valuable as, you know, any other kind of passing, but it is still a skill. Um, he's a reasonable team defender, although, you know, the team defense is the only part of the defense he's really there for. That's part of why this is the UVA versus Duke game that we're going over. So that practically I did speaking, not. I swear, it, the Duke people, I didn't pick this. I let everyone pick their games. This is our <laughs> seventh Duke game. It's just a great, <laughs> it is simply just a, a coincidence that we always try to find ta versus talent, and Duke has a lot of talent. Well, oh. also, also in my case, I was going with the Matthew Hurt. As much pressure as he puts on a defense in general, he does not put much pressure on his individual man because he doesn't care. He'll just shoot over them. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't really want to have to talk about that with Hauser because, practically speaking, like 
there are athletic limitations that he occasionally can cover, but occasionally can't. And you know what those are, and seeing them again isn't going to help them in single clip. Sentence. Yeah, you only need, you only need to do um, it really one time. Uh, right. The fan, we're getting a little bit of fan feedback. Just to let you know. Okay, um, so the air conditioning is off. That's uh, weird. Which it might be, it, it might be your computer fan. Uh is it running hot? Yeah, a little bit, but I can't really do much about that. Unfortunately, yeah, no, you can't. Still it's okay. with the, with him. Oh, yeah. well. No worries. Uh, people can. I mean, you've, if you've listened to the original Steam streams, this is nothing. Um, okay. R- real casual hours if this is bad audio for you. Um, real, <laughs> real Let's Watch Film heads have listened to the Echo Chamber from Hell and things that sound like experimental noise rock albums. So um, <laughs> at me with all complaints. All right. It'll take also, it away. It also might be the rain outside, but that's a separate issue. Yeah. I can't do anything about that yet. Yep. Yeah. I, I can't either. So here we are. Um, so let's see. So this play, Clark, yeah, Clark drives. We see Sam Hauser relocate. The important thing here to me was actually where he relocated to. So normally speaking, a lot of times in NBA, you'll actually have that slide to the corner that's open. But because of where Huff had cut to just prior to it, if he cuts to the corner, then his man can dig down onto Huff and easily cover down. So covering, basically re- relocating and, and basically just replacing Clark there, which is the typical thing you like try to do by default makes it to where that play doesn't collapse in on itself and gets it to where when Clark inevitably runs into the, oh crap, there's nothing here. Hauser is there to receive the kickback out. Hurt does a good job of keeping his shoulders tangled to where there's no like no back to anyone. So the relocation doesn't immediately result in a shot, but just knowing like, okay, it's gotta be to the top here rather than to the side is a big deal. And something I think matters for him going forward because he's going to be doing a lot of relocating around the perimeter. Yeah, I mean, uh, the case for Sam Hauser's, uh, for Sam Hauser being the best, if not most influential shooter in the draft is, is pretty mm-hmm. simple. Is that like there's not much he can't do. And if you're making the argument that like he's not probably not going to be asked to shoot off the dribble, uh, there's still like mm-hmm. a little bit of like, you know, step back relocation stuff when people close out super hard. So like that does matter yeah. for those guys in this draft who I like don't feel comfortable doing that in multiple directions. Yeah. And that's kind of what we saw in this last one is like, he's not going to do much off the dribble, but he can at least do, if you'll go back to the prior clip, because I think we yeah, kind of went by this one really quickly. Basically he can do that thing where, you know, against some defenders, he will at least put them on their back foot and get into the mid range. He's capable of making like some of those, okay, step through and into the, um, like the short mid range jumper shot. Um, and so like being able to do that at least gives him something he can do. It's sort of like how with Devin Vassell last year, he wasn't very good at getting to the rim with his dribble, but he could at least take it into the like shorter range, for, uh, shorter range off the bounce and make it from there. Hauser's not as good as Vassell was and doesn't have the weird two motion. Okay, we're going to be able to throw throw your block timing off with this, but he is at least able to make that shot consistently. So he's not just like purely consistently. Okay, I'm stuck here out of the perimeter. Um, but then you also have stuff like, uh, oh wait, no, this is not the play I thought it was. Um, the next one. On the, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I gave these to you in any clear order, so we may kind no, of... No, I, th- I, th- I just put them in chronological. Okay, so yeah, like, this this, this one, you know, so, so this this one is very much a, okay, basic relocation into movement three. The defender never loses him at any point in this. He just, you know, it's a slight hop into a one-two rather than a pure one-two. Um, yeah. But, you know, is able to take it, get it off cleanly, and the defender doesn't bother him because he's six foot eight. Yeah, I mean, Joe Harris is, is like sort of a testament to this. It's like if there's a high enough release point, like the contest kind of don't matter. I mean, Michael Porter right. Jr., like there's not a contest that bothers Michael Porter Jr. Yeah, although interestingly, the NBA data is conflicted on that just because the way they're, they're the way they measure contests is not exactly great. Um, yeah, basically there's, if, there's no correlation between height and the difference in your unguarded and guarded contested percentages. I, um, I think there is some um, meaningful noise in there, but yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's there 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 should be a difference. I think it's mostly just they're not measuring it well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, we get to this one. Um, let's see. Sorry, I, I'm also watching these clips for the first time in a week as well. So oh, uh, no right. worries. This this would be the drive that goes absolutely nowhere on Matt Hurt. Matt yes. Hurt, not the most athletic guy he's ever going to guard. And that's kind of one of the themes that you kind of saw consistently through the film is that he is willing to put the ball on the floor, but it doesn't really go anywhere no matter the defender because he's just not that crafty with the handle. So it is a weakness. He's, he's also never going to have to do it. Um, you know, like very rarely, but you know, we saw even like, you know, Clay Thompson, for example, dribbled very, very little for the first several stages of his career. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it, it, it's a matter of how teams will cover him because like 
what so like he will get run off the line at least in part nobody's nobody is totally immune from closeouts like even even if it's just running you off the line a half step or a quarter step like his counter is going to be the most interesting thing is like what is it that he does is it a retreat is it you know is it going into um uh like the grift bag to to making sure hard closeouts don't happen um i think there's a number of pathways that aren't limited by his athleticism it's just figuring out what he would do because like if you're struggling to take matt hurt off the bounce um <laughs> like there that is a a uh a portend of of uh not a lot of self-creation to come yeah and similarly like that last clip that we just went past also shows like the problems in his physical gifts in terms of uh in terms of rebounding because Damon Brickfield yeah. basically just completely you know, break, Breakfield goes. Um, break, break, Breakfield basically just can, completely seals him off to where he's nowhere close to being able to actually contest the uh, the rebound. Um, yeah. So yeah. Similarly, here's yeah. Here, here's the other clip. That's Joey Baker just going nowhere. Like yeah. Joey Baker again, not a good defender, and Hauser's just going nowhere with the dribble line. So that's kind of the consistent theme you see here is like Hauser does exactly what he does, and he does it at a level that. You know, arguably no one else in the class does. Um, and what he does is extremely valuable. But yeah, there are definite limitations here that you have to include in any in any strong watch of them. Yeah, I, I just think it's really important with with Hauser to have uh, specific, like if, if, if Hauser is higher on your board, you have to have specific answers about scalability, both defensive and offensive. And mm-hmm. like, it's not that he has limitations, it's that your team has to have limitations where he never goes below a certain usage or above a certain usage or even yeah. like ab- or above or below certain usage allocations or like he's he might not be an NBA player, like not a, a meaningful one. It's like that's not a particularly bad outcome because like anybody who could shoot like that at that size is going to be set for mm-hmm. life playing basketball. It's just a matter of can you get it to matter on a playoff stage? Yeah. And we did actually like, so the clip we just passed over, it was actually a fairly solid dig. And so that's kind of the things that you look at is like, as a, as a team defender, and this was much more prevalent in like the combine scrimmages, for example, because Virginia's schemes are much more rigid and less help oriented. Because a lot of times you'll see something like, basically the ball will swing to one side and Virginia by default actually will collapse to the, uh, to the corner shooter rather than uh, going like hard middle. Um, and so a lot of times you didn't see it as clearly there, but when he was asked to dig, he was actually fairly reliable about doing so. And then when he got to the combine, like, you know, that, that the team he was on was particularly abysmal, but he actually did a really good job of communicating, okay, I need someone to zone up here, or I need, you know, this rotation to happen here. Um, which are things that, like, a guy like him is going to have to do because he's never going to be able to physically keep up. But as long as the defense is, you know, as long as the defense is Kyle Korver before he got really old, he's fine. Um, the shooting is going to win out. Probably. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's that last one that's that's the killer. That that probably is the killer because like right, if it doesn't, yeah. there's just like there's not a floor for him. Right. Um, and and I think that like that's an interesting way of viewing upside as players who like sort of have three or four utility outcomes, and mm-hmm. like the five is like yeah, um, you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a one that is just not like it's not even G League useful. Like it's not a G League outcome where you play up and down. It's just like your skill set is really valuable, just not on a particular NBA floor. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think the dig utility is really interesting because I always wonder about how teams like Virginia, which are like extremely communicative when you you know scout them in person, how that translates to a combine setting where like maybe other teams don't have as rigorous demand, and so like maybe if they played a hundred combine games, like maybe mm-hmm. that advantage wouldn't be as visible. You know. uh hundred you know later in it but early it's like the Virginia guys are going to have uh a an advantage just because they're so used to playing in a scheme that demands uh extreme conversation mm-hmm. yeah this one has a had a glitch in my copy in my copy oh, okay. it, it on the replay it's clear I just couldn't yeah, get yeah. it to, to unfreeze. Um, yeah, so that, that that one basically what it was was it was Virginia doing their standard uh, hard hedge, and he actually does something that would basically in in college he can get away with it because the ball handlers aren't that good. In the NBA, basically he left a large enough gap for the, for an easy split. Yep. Um, and he gets the steal because Roach, I think it was, was just completely out of control of his handle. But positioning wise, like he needs to clean that up. And for an older guy, that might be a bit more of an issue because practically speaking, like. The only guy who's older than who's who's really incredible draftable range is like Duarte, who's six months older. Um, yeah. And so and, like. And Duarte has juice off the dribble. 
Wait, what? And Ju- and Duarte has like real juice off the dribble, oh, so yeah, like yeah. it's a it's just a different, Compared. but you know, uh, it's just a different calculation. Right. You just want um, to, for somebody who's playing, you know, who's going downhill on the age curve. <laughs> uh, it, it is it is difficult when he does have lapses in uh in in technique, especially because like that is going to have to be pristine for playoff utility. Um, so this clip actually was one I really like because it's actually a slightly live dribble pass, which he doesn't really make much of, and it's really super precise. Like he puts that right on the inside of the uh, of the right side of the rim where the rim protector can't come from. The help defender on the right side, on the strong side, is a like much smaller guy, and so like there's no one except Huff who can dunk that ball. And yeah. Huff obviously. This you know, is this it. is uh, you you would put this on a on, on a real floppy two yeah. steps. Yeah. Straight up and down. Yep. Yeah. There, there is no contesting that. Like that's just not something you can do anything about, um, at any level. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Right. This is this so, is the, the the ground coverage is tough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the ground coverage is tough, but the other thing is that even before the ground coverage is tough, he's already too low on the zone up in the first place. Um, and I get the part of that is trying to deny that that baseline pass. Um, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like. You know, he, he he needs to be one step up until the until the uh, until the driver is low enough to swing it, basically. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, but at the same time, like it is good recognition that, oh, yeah, this play is working out because like that was not a traditional pick and roll read. That was just a uh, the guard got beat and Huff had to help 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 immediately. So mm-hmm. like, it was a it was at least a good recognition of, oh, crap, there is something that's broken down here. I need to get to that guy really quite really quickly or there's going to be a wide open three point shooter. Um, and that the recovery to the guy in the corner was easier for the exile. Um, and so, like, that's kind of where it was, where it's like, yeah, the ground coverage is rough, and yeah, he was slightly out of position, but the recognition is also slightly ahead of, okay, where it actually needs to be. And that's kind of a lot of where his defense is, is, like, there's good recognition, and there's some plays where he's able to, you know, make use of his tools and get into, like, some impact on the play. But overall, like, yeah, the tools are limited, and, well, also, a lot of the times the position just isn't as picture perfect as it has to be. Um, and for him, like, the like the, the, the term here is the margin of error, right? For him, yeah. the margin of error is just so much, like, so much larger. No, smaller. Smaller is the direction we're going here. Because, yeah. you know, again, those tools are limited. Um, and so he, he has to be within a certain bounds, and a lot of times he just narrowly misses those certain bounds. Um, I do think it's worth noting that, like, at the combine, he appeared much less physically outmatched. Like, he was able to keep up with whichever Champagny he was playing in the matchup that I remember him bringing, and would have been Julian, because he was the one who was actually a prospect. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in general, like, he wasn't getting physically overwhelmed in these, like, high physical intensity settings. But, again, that's the combine, and the combine is not necessarily always as meaningful, and we have a much larger sample of him being physically limited. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't really take anything the only thing i take from combine is your ability to like measure and even that comes with a huge grain of salt i'm just not a person who like unless you're really unless you show a completely different prospect than what we saw in college Mm -hmm. i don't take the combine really seriously it's nice that like the the communication stuff and the like aggressiveness because like again you can't really tell how people are defensively like wired in in virginia because like they just play a certain way and it looks the same Mm -hmm. for pretty much everybody but it is interesting that that like that propensity I'll take away. But like generally, I would just assume that like he was playing up. He was playing, you know, downhill on the age curve and he's about to be playing uphill on it. And that outmatching just seems even if it wasn't at the combine, it's 100 percent going to happen in the NBA. So the question is, like, is he a 45 percent shooter regardless of shot type? Yes or no. So the answer is yes. Like, OK, like we can talk about first round. We can talk about fits. I have no problem with any of that. If the answer is 43%, like, I'm really sorry. It's probably not going to work out. Like, that's what, it, it, taking the hardest shots possible, can you shoot 45%? Is that is that fair? Uh, is everybody else on roughly the same page? Like, I mean, at 45 is not a uh, means-tested number by any sense. I'm just pulling out the, the general level that I would consider elite for off-ball guys. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that even like 41 or 42 was sufficient volume. And that's the thing, like, because of his ability to shoot off so much motion, and I think there was also a pick and pop play in there that yeah. we kind of score over where he's like literally one, two, he reverses the one, two, so the foot works backwards. But regardless, like being able to get into the shot so quickly does give him the ability to scale on volume to the point where you could justify like 39, 40, 41, those ranges. Um, especially because like the team defense, again, all it has to be is just enough. Um, and then the shooting, and, and then the shooting again, might become overwhelmed. Because, like, I don't think the shooting necessarily depends as much on the percent as much as how the teams are actually going to respect it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, teams are I don't think the pick and pop stuff is, is like, I, th I think that it's like he wouldn't have a ton of pick and pop utility because I think you can kind of box him out of on, switch on switches. Like, I don't think he can, I don't think his catch yeah, radius is large enough that you can just crowd him out of. Um, but he's also, not super like, if physical. like if, if, if any pick and pop with him is just an instant switch, that's a pretty big advantage for a lot of offenses too. Yeah, I would um, just rather have him with the Spain because then, like, you have to deal with the two axe uh, angles, and since like the the Spain offers a even more uh, movement, it, there's less chance that like anybody gets a piece of it. And I don't know. I I just worry that like while switching isn't a problem, it's like you could just next every screen he's in. And that would be a bigger problem for his archetype than it would for other people. Um, so I think that like the the real question is like what's like everybody kind of has a number. Uh, again, I pulled mine out of uh, thin air, but I think that it, it is a like for for almost for for very few prospects. Can you ask? Can you boil their prospect hood down to a uh, 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 a binary? And with Hauser, it's like. Is he an NBA elite shooter, regardless of shot selection? If the answer is yes, like I'm starting, to, I, I'm 25 is not too high for me. I might be galaxy braining this question, but just like one thing I feel like I've noticed watching the league over the recent years is that it seems like the game gets more and more spaced every year. Guys are shooting from deeper. I wonder, like, do you think Hauser could be a dude who's, you know, potentially spacing from like six, seven feet? Yeah. Yeah. Beyond the break or more than that, like he, he, he pretty regular right spots up out there. Yeah, I mean, like I, I from seeing him shoot like casually before, I don't, I don't think it like Ryan Anderson's shot diet is is a pretty easy graph. He does not have anywhere close to like the off the bounce game that Rhino had, especially young Rhino. But like the shot diet that Rhino had in uh in orlando like the latter half when his when he started to like lose a step and he was an off ball guy would basically just be the shot diet i would give him like all right let's go figure it out um and you did get an answer for it pretty quickly i don't think that like if you're if you're a good team like that's a, that's an extremely worthwhile upside bet to try to win some playoff games all right i love that we get the mix that we've had we've had guys who are udfas we've had guys who you know are are like, I mean, I, I would probably have Hauser in like the 60s for bad teams. It's just like not not an interesting prospect uh, because like they just need so much they're not going to get like uh, like uh, dollars to to across value unless there's some guy you need to maximize gravity because his creation burden is so crazy. Um, we've had you know uh, guys who could be placed from 30 to 60. We were going to have a uh, lottery guys coming up soon, and next we have my favorite player of the draft, um, like. It, I'm not saying he's the best player. Um, yeah. It's just that uh, my favorite player, because he does not believe in business decisions um, to other people, to his, uh, to his beneficence and also to his troubles. Um, he's the coolest person in this draft by like an extremely large amount. Um, yeah. uh, he's the most jacked I've ever seen a basketball player in my life. Um, and that is uh, France's very own Ponce. Yes. So no, the pressure is on me now, actually. Yeah. No, you're <laughs> going to crush this. Um, okay. So tell me what, tell me about Eve. Um, I, yeah. I think the. He, he was like, he always has been known in France, especially since uh, I think it was U17 World Cup mm -hmm. in Spain, uh, where I was like 16 and he was like dunking from not the free throw line, but he was like putting amazing highlights. So he became like a fan favorite, like uh, Instagram favorites or, or stuff like this. Then we all saw that he went to play Tennessee in the NCAA. It was like good news. He didn't play like a lot as, as you 
you know uh, the first two seasons and then you became starter like the last two seasons and uh, yeah also played FIBA U20 like in uh, Israel in uh, 2019 where you had according to me like the one of the best one-on-one -on -one, uh, defense on Denny Denny Avdija from uh, Israel it was like good on him uh, and yeah like he's uh, a really really cool guy as you said a really intelligent guy high iq uh, guy and that's something i want to insist on the on the viewing and uh yeah freak of nature yeah uh i saw him in that u16 and he instantly became one of our favorites because he did uh he's like one of the few guys you'll see like at a u16 level do a uh catching a mid post uh reverse pivot rip through yeah. one one step two foot back scratcher and i was like oh um yeah uh sign me up he's 16 yeah sign me up for all the years of this and yeah. usually like he i mean ricky ricky is definitely familiar sometimes you see guys at a u16 level and like they're u16 heroes and they're just like you know that you remember oh remember that time that you know uh you know a kid who like, kind of peaked early and, and ended up being like a fine college prospect yeah every time i've seen eve i'm just like no it's as fun as the first time just keep just keep making yeah. these highlight decisions my guy um let me know when you want me to, to run this or if you have more overview you'd like to do. Yeah, some, some principal concepts like you asked me, I wanted to like highlight is all defensive awareness. Like he's not only a freak athlete, like he's not only a sports center highlight reel. To me, it's like he has really good understanding of the game. He analyzes both offensive sets quite well. Uh, he's very vocal also on defense. Uh, he was like to me the the, the leader of that Tennessee team. Uh, he's, like that's what I wanted to highlight. Like he has great physical tools, but for the past two seasons, I thought he improved his like defensive uh, understanding, and with his tools it, that helped him become like one of the yeah, one of the better defender uh, in the in the NCAA. Also wanted to highlight his like body control. I would say more on mm -hmm. defense than in than on offense like he is a great shot blocker he's a great shot blocker because he's he has amazing hang time but he's also i suppose i th i think he has like good body control uh, mm -hmm. and he has he loves also to block shot with his opposite hand with the right hand which means he, he can like have a long hang time and be have a good body control as i said is um one of the more negative side and, and something that is going to be key uh, for in, it, in his translation to the NBA is like his offensive indecision as a spot up shooter, I would say. Like he refuses open threes and sometimes prefers to drive with his right, with his, le with his left hand, sorry. And I was wondering what does, what does it mean for his NBA future if he's not willing to shoot? Uh, whenever he's free, uh, because he's not a plus, uh, a plus uh, uh, player on offense, I would say. So that's something I would like to have uh, your advice and the advice of the other of the guest on that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I like we joke about Eve as like you know being an extremely fun pro pl player, but like I think Eve is a real prospect. Like yeah. I, I, all like, he is an extremely um, interesting energy big. Um, who like can do a number of things that are valuable in the modern NBA. It's not just that he does extremely cool dunks um, yeah. is the most ripped person alive, but it's also that, like there is something there and, and that is legitimately valuable. And uh, the way that Tennessee plays um, and, and, and the way that Tennessee played was honestly based a lot around Eve's ability for uh, recovery blocks and um, like the ability to, to be an opportunistic scorer uh, on, sure. on the glass and in, in finishing a short roll. So, I mean, I think that there is uh, most certainly a uh, a uh, something there. Let's let this run. Um, yeah, he was not born to be big. Like actually, mm -hmm. for the youth national team, he played the three. But Interesting. Yeah, he played the three, and uh, which is more like love is like of, on that clip. Like his head always have his head moving. Analyze is always watching the ball, always watching the uh, his of his uh, opponents on the on the corner. Like he's like hunting, actually, he's like a, mm -hmm. like a, like a falcon, I would say, and then <laughs> jump to mm -hmm. jump the ball to intercept the ball. Like 
His overall defensive awareness is, according to me, like kind of underrated. Uh, mm. Although everyone speaks about highlight will block and all that stuff, but yeah, everyone is going to talk about that block, I suppose, that is coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. because that one was like kind of crazy. Uh, at the end time, a block with the right end again, as I said. Like it's it's pretty crazy how, how he is able to like is like again the against his, his opponents like accept the contact. Yeah, I mean, I think that like his positioning is also like yes, the energy is really high. Yes, he like hangs in the air for for ten minutes to punch this, but like he's bouncing back and forth. He's he's adjusting yeah. angles, and the second that the big turns their head, similar to how like we saw Ayai cut when you know the the head is turned how we've seen, you know, just like general awareness from other players, just because Eve is uh, capable of, of flying, unlike many other humans, um, yeah. we can't discount the fact that, like, this is, like, he does have uh, a defensive awareness that, like, is valuable. And I think, like, if I were, um, like, I, I don't know if he's, like, a, a, a draftable guy, but for a UDFA, like, if I were developing, um, yeah. uh, like, if I were a G League team, he would be one of the, like, a, a piece that would really help develop other young guys. Um, for like, sure. Especially like uh, Oklahoma City, for example, yeah. where it's just like he he understands positionality, he can clean up mistakes, and uh, yeah. like because of so much of Tennessee is based on his ability to understand the angles. Uh, yeah. Like there's so many times where like they're in the general right spot, he's the 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 guards are told to hold a spot, and then Eve comes to clean it up, and that's yeah. that's pretty important for teaching guard positionality is having something like that to to enforce that like no this does work. For sure. Like on the clip before, it was like good on ball against against uh, Drew Smith, mm-hmm. uh, which is not the most bursty guard, uh, but is is a good and see and see the black guard and is able to is able to he gets crossed, but he's, he has amazing recovery again, again mm-hmm. amazing recovery and the, the right end again is is going to block, is coming to block the shot, and then there, I love I I'm not really sure how to. Um, and this in English, but he, the way he orientates his opponents to mm-hmm. his like weak hand, I would say. Mm-hmm. Orientates yeah, him to, yeah, we'd we'd say uh, like pushes him to their weak hand. Yeah, for sure. And so the the number twenty four is not able to like have a clean look, and then I was again as a weak side guy there. It's like never like the, the play is never dead. We believe the play is always alive, and yeah, love is. He's a great student of the game where I had the chance to interview him last year. He said he, he loves tape. He's watching a lot of tape. And I think he's coming to... That's, it seems hard because he's, I suppose he's guarding a lot of different and various opponents in the seasons mm-hmm. because of Tennessee's game. But he's like on their ability to play, off, play on board, defend on board, defend off board. Weak side rim protector uh, is able to... Orient, uh, Orientate on the, the the wrong hand, as I said, uh, mm. in bad English. But yeah, <laughs> your English is fantastic. Uh-huh. <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, love is love is energy on that play. Like the the, the like five or six first clips are all defensive clean clips. Like the first half of that game was like a defensive clinic by Eve. Like mm-hmm. it was, I think it was the game like like one of us, first game of SEC play. Like last game of December twenty 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 twenty. Yeah, um, the the like his positioning is, is really good to stay involved in plays. Um, a lot of times yeah. he, he has a great understanding of like where to hide as a shot blocker. I mean, it sounds weird considering the fact it's like a giant person, but like he's yeah. able to to sit in people's peripheral vision to stay on his toes to wait until they expose the ball. Because like for as like as much as he's in the air, we generally like to think of like shot blockers who are low foul rate as like on yeah. the ground guys. Like he's getting all of these in the air, and he's fairly low. Like his his success percentage is very high for not getting fouls. Yeah, um, and because of Tennessee's scheme, is also like sometimes responsible of the pick and pop five on the corner. Like if he, if, if Tennessee was going to play Real Madrid, he was like going to have to keep Usman Garuba on the on the on the, the corner every time. So mm-hmm. he needs to have his 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 eyes on the on his opponent, but he's also like hunting as a as a weak side wing protector. So that's, yeah. he has like two or three lecture. Uh, of reads, reads, sorry, lecture is a French mm-hmm. name actually, yeah. but uh, reads in every like uh, defensive set. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, the thing that, that is the biggest concern about me for offense is, is his movement skills. Um, yeah. At times, like he's very comfortable jumping off two feet and it limits when he is being played on the perimeter more his finishing because he, he does want to jump off two. His, his many of his finishes come off too. And so when he has to cover space with early dribble pickups because his, his handle is not there um, yeah. yet, it, it, it creates a, a distance like what, what happens here where like he picks it up early and he doesn't know how to get to the finish he wants to. So there's kind yeah. of like four feet where he's like, oh, I don't know. And that, that's what allows this, this, uh, this yeah, guard dig. Shot here. Yeah. yeah. Like this should be easy for him to, if he's able to jump off one foot with three as a Euro step or just extending. Sure. Yeah. But that comfort level is not there yet. And, and that can be very difficult uh, for especially like really explosive players who have success in one style of jumping. Like, Sure. It, it can be difficult to, to go from two feet to one foot. Um, yeah. Like the difficulty of to go from two feet and the, the lack of handle, like it's like it's, um, uh, it's not, it's, it's like affecting his athletic skills. Like yes. His, he, he plays, yeah. he plays like a, like he would be a normal person and not like and an athletic guy, but, uh, and he's the most athletic guy in the SEC. So yeah, that's, it's something he needs to work on there and needs to not there because the, 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 the help is good there, but needs to, yeah, maybe be more bouncy, I would say early on, yeah. but he's also like you know, on the clipper, uh, so some of the clip is like, is, and I want to focus on this, the, the is like unwillingness to get to shot open three. That's yes. some, something is ne really needs to work on mentally, I would say. And, uh, I, I know he's working on his jump shot. He said it to everyone, I suppose, but he needs to, because he has, I, I don't know what you think and what, but I think he has like this turn one jump shot is, the, it does this a lot. And yeah. And it's always he, off he, that two foot gather. For pattern. Sure. Yeah. He like, he's going, he's, he's going right, then turn around or he's mm -hmm. going left, then turn around. Like, but yeah, it I shows mean, like not bad touch, I would say. Yeah. I, I think that like, um, like they're not the same uh like overall styles of players but like looking at how chris boucher is used yeah um at, at a g league level i mean boucher uh, is a little bit rangier but just like the that is going to be the general profile of eve ponds i think that yeah. uh he's more of a dunker spot guy than like a straight rim runner For um sure. But uh, also being shorter has those effects. But like Boucher really changed when he like just started to get volumes of threes up, and the percentages okay. spiked and and unspiked. I mean, the the initial segment he had was unsustainable, but there's certainly a pathway for um, a positional hyperactive defender who uh, mm -hmm. is a, is a small ball five, but is capable of switching uh, on on stronger fours and even some really strong threes. Um, that's a that sure. is a player who will uh, get serious NBA looks. Um, yeah. it's just a matter of how his comfort level with taking the threes that teams will give him because like, obviously no one wants him with a runway to the rim. No, love is overall defensive, uh, aware of law there. Like, mm -hmm. Vocal pointed, uh, opponents to his, to his teammates who runs a lot on that, on that set actually. Mm -hmm. and like everyone in France is asking me who, who is a comp for eight points? Like everyone wants to know with what I, I think or what everyone think he could become. And I really struggled to find mm -hmm. something. I, I said like last year, I said like, oh, Miami used Derek Jones in some some certain sets. I mm -hmm. thought it was, of course, he's, he's a lefty, like explosive guy, but the comparison was more like a small ball five or yeah. a four close to a, a stretch five, a big stretch five, like, like Myers Leonard could, could be, was last year for the, for Miami. But I think it's more in that, in that role model that is going to stay in the NBA and have like a second contract. Yeah. I mean, I think that this, like, I mean, I guess that the closest parallel is probably like Raekwon Gray. I mean, uh, Raekwon is, is not nowhere near as explosive, but just like these big body yeah. guys who, who, yeah who have positional versatility um, mm -hmm. and will depend on like, you can kind of throw them at a, at a wide variety of offensive archetypes. And like, I, I think Eve is going to have a lot of success against really skinny fives um, yeah. because of his low center of gravity, physicality, and just like that. The guys who jump off one foot are always going to have a little bit of trouble. Skinny guys who jump off one foot are always going to have a little more trouble with strong guys who jump off two. It's just uh, yeah, a rock, paper, scissors arrangement. Um, 
and uh, getting him into situations where you can leverage that um, is, is going to be really important. And also, like, it's a it, it is valuable, provided, of course, he takes like that shot needs to go up. Yes, he gets it yeah, down yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's but great. That's what I, I wrote. If he refuses the shot, okay, he gets the dunk, but needs to need to take that shot in the NBA. Yeah. Because this closeout, like it's a it's a disrespectful closeout of the <laughs> of the jumper. Yeah. Like it, he would have more dunks it, should he shoot at volume. Because people have to close out harder. You close out harder, you get more dunks. And yeah. so, like, well, this is what happens when a college center closes out. That's not necessarily how it works in the NBA, where they're just not going to give you that corner. Um, For sure. So I think he had like twenty-two dunks mm-hmm. in the in the season. Maybe not enough for a guy like like. Yeah, um, and that's just going to be, you know, if it, it, if teams know you're not going to shoot, they can have situations where like that that closeout's mm-hmm. a little bit closer. Closer yeah. close out that turns into a dunk, and and that that sure. millimeters matters a lot when you're a two foot jumper because like as Keon and Springer, which you know we've talked about, and Keon uh, we, will, we will be talking about, um, yeah. like as a two foot jumper, you just have less of a margin for error in the half court, and here we can see that sure. if he gets a maybe like two toes in, yeah. in the paint, that's a dunk on somebody. Yes, some people will say like, okay, if he refuses like one or two pick and top shots, but he then like went for dunk or it's a difficult jumper. But as you sometimes mention, the difficulty of shots is 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 interesting in how we evaluate the prospect. Like, okay, he it it he, he he made that shot, but it was not the easiest way to score on that position. So. Mm-hmm. Maybe the easiest path to scoring for him is like eight pick and pop shots, and that's something he needs to to work on. Yeah, I lo- love the the solution he give, he give he's giving key on on that play, like always hustling and is key. Uh, I'm, I I like Kion, but I, he, without even that play, I think it's 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 a bad turnover. Absolutely, um, it's it's certainly like. In a lot of ways, I think that like the the Tennessee defense like is reliant on the sort of players that the Tennessee offense shouldn't have. Like yeah, they, yeah. they're almost repellent forces. Where it's like, yeah, they have all these like really physical guys who are really good in small space. You know, very explosive, very like very yeah. sudden athletes. Not like stridey guys like a Derek Jones Jr. Who you know, Love that did, play. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> was is able to box out at mm-hmm. the beginning against like a big. Big man, then the Keon. I think Keon is running, is running at the fast break. Mm-hmm. It stays back, like kind of free safety, I would say. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then is again the right hand for the block. I think he has amazing balance on that on that play mm-hmm. uh, to to protect the rim. Yeah, kind of uh, amazing again. Yeah, I, I mean, we just got finished watching Kai Jones, who like basically had the exact same footwork and couldn't get a much easier shot. Like a, a much lower, much, uh, uh, much uh, lower arc, and then you compare that because, like, Kai is a one foot jumper. He's you know sort of the opposite style of athlete. You know, yeah. he, he's capable of force generation. You know, he can certainly get up, but he's he's a strider. He's somebody who never looks like he's expelling a ton of effort. Like it never looks easy for Eve to do these things. No, you can see that he's like, you know, really gutting it out. Um, but he's he's so much more capable in these small spaces and you know finding circumstances where that works is, is certainly something that the MP, modern nba can do um but tennessee kind of struggled to <laughs> for sure yeah that's not that just shouldn't be possible man <laughs> no no it shouldn't be like or even or he should like be in the olympics if he is yeah. able to do this a bit i mean it just seems like he double jumped yeah um yeah, like this is this is really exciting. The ability to to close out hard. I mean, I know this is yeah. really nerdy, but like he closes out supremely on balance twice, yeah. and then sprints twice. for his life. Yeah. yeah, and then sprints for his life. Like, I mean, I I would be really interested in the second spectrum data to see like how much faster he uh, like takes off on his you know rim runs than than the average prospect because it seems like he's very quick out of those yeah. blocks to set up his mind and just like. Driving first steps, driving yeah. second steps. Yeah, he's, he's blocking, tagging his his man, then sprinting yeah, on the like, on the go. corner. Like his cardio is, and he, he said to me like he's he, he's working consistently on his cardio. Like he's very proud of that actually. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, it. If I looked like that, I'd do everything I could to look like that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, any disagreements? Any ideas? Any uh, additional uh, Herculean moments we may have missed from Eve Ponds? Uh, I just want to start by saying, alone, I I am uh, so admirable of you uh, <laughs> because, man, if I order like if I order Mexican food in Spanish, I feel like I'm the most cultured person I know. And you yeah, just but... you just did a a technical not like a podcast like oh yeah my day was good you have like a technical driven podcast in another language and like on camera and yeah. uh, across the country it's just like that that's wild to me I just want to say thank you for yes. for trusting for trusting me to to do this because like yeah that just I I'm really thankful that you did this and and you got to talk about a guy that like uh, is really awesome. Well, uh, I'm listening a lot to English content, so <laughs> it, it helps actually. But yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, I apologize for using slang so much. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, thoughts on uh, thoughts on Eve, uh, uh, thoughts on you know potential pathways to to rosterhood or or developmental pathways for for finding synergistic relationships with other G League or or two way way guys. Anything jump out? I mean, my first thought is that is he the best NFL prospect in this? Oh NFL? no, Hassan French is Hassan French is. <laughs> Hassan French is literally an NFL prospect now. Well, then Pond's got to be top two or three because yeah. I don't know if he should be putting his hand on the ground as a pass rusher or be catching a fade route, but the flash athleticism is just wild. Yeah, it's, I never asked him. He, he always played like, like football. As you, say, as you call it, football is not very big in, in France. He played soccer like we all play soccer uh, growing up, and then he shifted to to basketball but actually but um he, he hasn't he has not like a football background uh they, if if sec coaches were aware of him in high school uh they would have yeah. they would have made some phone calls For um sure. i've thought about eve ponds and poku a lot i will not lie to you oh. um uh <laughs> okay. it would potentially be like i i think poku does play quite a few g league minutes next year um, just yeah. to try to get him as many like he, he's just so low on the minutes threshold and like he needs as much as possible and i don't know what that team looks like next year to be honest um and there are always questions about how like i don't say losing basketball but like uh basketball not within like there, there's upper and lower boundaries of, of you know what needs to happen and yeah um that would certainly be an interesting one um For sure. Uh, anybody else have potential interesting fits? Um, okay, Ricky, you want to get plugs? Ah, he bounced. Okay, uh, follow Ricky at, at SBN uh, underscore Ricky. If you are here, you already know who Ricky is. I'm literally doing promo for the Hollywood of, of draft coverage. I get it. Um, all right. Um, I think that gets our guys out of here. Um, everybody hit, hit with promos. You're obviously welcome back later. Um, after this, I'm going to take like a 10 minute break and eat some food. I think I have some, some wings that I could do real fast. Um, while we prepare stats and stuff, um, uh, to let everybody know, um, where you guys are. And I just want to thank each and every one of you guys for, for doing clips and putting yourself out there. Uh, I know breaking stuff down on camera, uh, over, over zoom is not easy. And I just appreciate everybody for taking time out of your days. Uh, it, yeah, I took more time than I should. And I just want to say thank you. So let them know where you can find them. Sure. Uh, you can find me at Canyon Driver on Twitter or at LakersDraft.substack.com. Feel free to subscribe. So you can find me, but my my work is in French actually. I can do um, some English work. Uh, I have done like a FIBA U18 Africa round up in wrap up in in, uh, in English last uh, December. Was about, about some prospects that could be in the NBA or in the Indians to the next next season. Uh, I'm at Alan Giu nine nine nineteen six, uh, and uh, I will have some content, I suppose, in the next month because I will be attending FIBA U sixteen Europe and U eighteen in uh, Slovenia, Slovakia, and Macedonia. So I will have maybe some contents and some thoughts to say about about that so thank you very much pj again of course um thank thank each and every one of you um and then 
And I'm Joseph Nation at JNA1 on Twitter. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I, uh, any, the stuff I write can be found at the dash looney dash ben.com. Looney like Kevin, uh, like Kevin Looney's uh, last name. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me again. All right. Thank you. Well, I'm going to take us to the 2003 draft um, and grab a little bit of food because uh, a stomach of coffee has weirdly turned on me. Who would have possibly seen that coming? 